Good morning once again. Um, we're still running the racetrack, and this morning we have Dave Polly, and he's going to be talking about contract plans. He is the senior standards engineer, so please say good morning to Dave Polly. So I'm not sure how many of you know me. You've probably heard my name, um, at least uh, hopefully in a good context, not necessarily always in a good context. That guy said no to me about something. So um, a little bit about myself before I get started, and this will help, help get me started. Um, I came to work at ODOT in April of 1980. So I am about to hit my 40th anniversary. The first 10 years of my career was out in the field, started in Region 3, went up briefly into Region 1, spent some time at Parks, which was part of ODOT at the time, in Region 2 on a statewide traveling crew, moved to Bend, was in Region 4, and then in 1990 I moved to Salem. That was right before the birth of my second child, we had a son when we moved from Bend to Salem. My daughter was born that summer of 1990, my first daughter. My wife asked me when we had that little girl if I would ever wear a pink shirt. And I said, sure, I'd wear a pink shirt. I was in right-of-way descriptions at the time, and so I wore the pink shirt, and I happened to wear it two consecutive Fridays in a row. And one of the guys I was working with said, Dave, why do you always wear a pink shirt on Fridays? And I said, you need to turn your cell phone off. And I said, because it is Pink Shirt Friday. And for 29 years, I have wore a pink shirt almost every Friday. And so today is Friday, you can tell, because I'm wearing a pink shirt. So, trying to figure out how to turn my sound off, my phone. Well, we'll just, we're going to try it with, uh, we're going to roll the dice, see how well that, see how well that is. So, I'm <clears throat> welcoming you today on uh, Pink Shirt Friday Day. Uh, if you have never seen any of my presentations before, uh, note that um, all of the pictures have absolutely nothing to do with what I'm talking about. The pictures are there for your entertainment and enjoyment. Most of the pictures, well almost, I can't, I can't vouch for this first picture that's up here, but all the other pictures except one are taken in Oregon. Most of them came from inside ODOT, the photo, uh, photo of the month. I steal those and use those in presentations, so we will enjoy taking a look. Oops, taking a look at some of the uh, some of the pictures and the beauty of Oregon uh, as we go through uh, today's presentation. What we're going to cover is how contract plans are organized, some of the key components, what a typical section is supposed to convey. 
Understanding some construction notes, we're going to look at some real plan sets, and we're going to uh, address any questions that you have. So I'm going to give you 40 years worth of experience here in the next 50 minutes. So we went through and, and uh, did some organization changes to the contract plans over the last couple of years. And this was very arduous and a very difficult thing to do. We went through and got all of the disciplines to use the same title block all the way through a set of plans. Now that sounds simple and an easy task, but it was arduous because Bridge had this fabulous title block that they were willing to die for that went across the bottom of the sheet. And everyone else had this weird one in the corner, and how do we reconcile all of that? Well, we were able to finally get everybody on the same page. When we did that, then we set up major categories for the way that the, the plans are laid out. And it's not any different than what historically we have done, but we set it up so that folks would then know exactly where they were in the plan. So the major categories are listed and they are corresponding now to the, to the plan sheet page number. So if you are looking at title sheets, you're looking at the A series sheets. If you're looking at roadway details, you're looking in the B series. The C series is gonna always show the roadway main line. Traffic control will always be in the E series. Geotechnical, if you're looking for that, it's in the G series. Again, hydraulics is going to be in the H. J is always going to be the bridge plans. We don't use the letter I. And the reason is, is that when it is in the font that we, that we use that for down in the, in the plan sheet number, it can be easily confused with the number one. And so we don't want any confusion with I. So we don't use the letter I. We also don't use the letter O because it can be confused with zero. And so we, we leave that out. So, the, so, there's al so there's always these major categories of uh, disciplines in the plan set. So you, you may, in your plan set, you may not have a J-series in this set of plans because you didn't have any bridge work. So if, there's, if, if that category is not there, we're going to skip that series. But, but these are the series where they will always be. So, so contractors, so if you've got a, a guy that's out there that's doing signals, he always knows... My set of plans are in the M series, so I want the M numbered plans, always. So it makes it a lot easier for uh, different subcontractors to always pull out those, those sets of plans and, and look at the uh, particulars that, that they have. Each major category has subgroups. So we can uh, break things down and segregate um, items. So if you have a signal project and you've got um, several intersections of signals, then those signals will be broke out with another letter. So you start out with the, with the uh, I got to go back here and take a look at what my signals are in the M series. So I may have MA, MB, MC, MD as I go down through the different 
intersections. So that's the logic that the plans are set up in, and hopefully you all are experts at reading and knowing how these are set up. The basis of knowing where you're at in the world of a set of plans is the stationing. And the stationing can be in mile points or they can be in engineer's stations. So if you're dealing with a, um, a project that's in uh, mile points, they're going to be listed to the hundredth of a, of a mile or every 52 feet. Mile points also increase north to south, west to east, except for I-5. Mile points on I-5 go the other way. And so you have mile point 300 at the Markham Bridge. But if you're at mile point 300 on US 101, you're down at Brookings. Or if you're at mile point 300 on US 97, you're down at Klamath Falls. So that's the only really weird thing that you got to keep in mind is I-5 is different. This, this, uh, this photo, by the way, it's taken at the Oregon Zoo. And uh, I was able to get a shot of the lioness uh, as she was looking at me and thinking about lunch. Um, the engineer stations, um, the, the stations are, uh, each station is 100 feet, and so um, the whole station is to the left of the plus sign, and, and uh, the partial station is to the right, so that station 253 plus 48, 6.64 is 25 thousand three hundred forty eight point six four feet from the origin so you can easily uh, figure out distances if you've got stationing if you've got two stations you just subtract the difference between the station provided that there's no equation between those two and you will get the distance and again these increase north to south and west to east in general. Equa equations uh, end up when we've, when we've done some realignment on, on sections of road uh, and they uh, can occur both in the mile points and in the engineer stations. So if you're, um, if you're uh, doing mile points uh, down by uh, uh, Bandon, uh, you will notice that Bandon, uh, the mile points do this, uh, well, between Coos Bay and Bandon, uh, they do this real weird uh, jump. There's a big jump at Bandon. And the reason being is that the, the mile points for 101 used to go over to Coquille. Well, when they straightened the road long ago, the mile point Change. So they had this equation, and it's right in band, and it jumps about 20 miles. So there's a, there's a, uh, a little hiccup there, and you'll see those occasionally. The equations are always written like fractions. So you've got a, uh, you're going to have an, a head and a back station on those. Sometimes the equations will overlap, and sometimes there'll be a gap. The one at Bandon is a gap, um, and I don't know where, where the overlaps are, but occasionally you'll run into an overlap on, uh, on the equations. So you want to, uh, you have to pay attention, and usually those are going to be listed uh, if they're more than 50 feet, if the equation uh, has more than 50 feet of jump in it, it's going to be listed on the title sheet. It's supposed to be listed on the title sheet if there's more than a 50-foot jump. 
If it's, a, if it's less than 50 feet, then we generally consider that a minor uh, jump. That'll be in the plan set. The equations should always be in the, in the plan set. But on the title sheet, if it's more than 50 feet, it should show up on the title sheet as well. Alignment abbreviations. Uh, hopefully you guys all know or are familiar with these. Uh, in Oregon, we do spirals, which is a changing uh, radius uh, curve. So we do spirals at the start of our curves. It's the way drivers dry, actually drive the road. Um, and so it gives a little more forgiveness. It's a way that we can uh, change the, uh, the uh, super elevation or the banking of the curve. Um, uh, that's usually where that occurs. So we um, call that out as the PS, that's the point of spiral. The PSC, it's the point of spiral to curve. So where the radius quits uh, uh, changing or is variable, it goes into a constant, uh, a constant uh, curve or constant radius curve and then it comes back out into a spiral. Uh, occasionally you might see a PI listed, which is a point of intersection of two tangents. And this is all thrilling stuff. Uh, as uh, as uh, guys that are, uh, I've spent almost 30 years in, in roadway design as a geometric designer, and this stuff just is the bomb. <laughs> so, you know, you guys look at it and you go, wow, oh, what's this? All this weird stuff, mathematic stuff that doesn't matter. And, well, yeah, it does matter to us, <laughs> us geeky roadway designer people who are thrilled with geometrics and, and love pictures like, uh, pictures of roads like this, which is coming off, I believe, Crown Point. Point, but I'm, it might be over in Eastern Oregon. Nice curvy alignment. Um, typical sections, they show what the surfacing material is. That's, that's really the purpose of a, um, of a typical section is. It'll also show the uh, lane configuration and it's uh, kind of the backbone of the project. So if you're, uh, if you're doing mill and fill, you know, that's gonna be shown up in your typical sections and you're gonna be able to see what the, what the depth is. If you're doing an overlay, you're gonna be able to see what the depth of, of material is. If they're digging into the subgrade, that's gonna be shown on the typical sections. And so you're gonna be able to see how much are they, how much are they digging down so you can, you can uh, see what the, what the total amount is and be able to, to know, oh, I should have a big ditch out on the road here and here. And you can tell that on the uh, typical sections. Oh, I forgot to put a picture in here. Um, so this is, a, this is a general typical section. So <clears throat> one of the things that, that's gonna occur on a typical section is we show both a cut on one side and a fill on the other. That's so that it's, as, uh, as it jumps back and forth for the location, the contractor will know whether, whether to apply the left side or to the right side. And so it's not exactly, it's not a detail. Don't look at it as a detail. It should show a cut or a fill if there are, uh, for, that, uh, for that listing of the, of the stations, for that typical section, it, if there's both cuts and fills on that section, it should show a uh, difference between right and left, but they're applied the same. So in this case, if you had a, on the uh, left side of the, of the picture, if you had a cut section 
occurring on the right side, then you would apply it, um, you would apply the cut section to that and not have a sidewalk as shown on the right side. Similarly, if you had a fill on the left side, you'd have the sidewalk and, and all of that. This is an actual um, uh, typical section that I pulled from a set of plans. You can see that they're going to do some cold plain uh, pavement removal in the center. Uh, they're going to go, uh, looks like about 17, 17 feet plus mm, about 7 feet on the shoulder for the cold plain. Then they're going to do a sock cut. They're going to dig down into the sub base. So when you're looking at your, so when you're going out and looking at your project, that's what you should be seeing. And if you're not seeing that, and something's something's awry, so you want to see some, so you want to see that that uh, that work occurring to the outside and not to the inside. You want to see a, a milling operation going down the middle of your project here and not somebody with a hoe digging out the center of your road because that's not what was intended and that's not what you're supposed to be paying for. Stacks are funny little things. Um, occasionally we get into a more complicated typical sections and we uh, and there's a lot of things going on and so what we'll do is is instead of repeating uh, the main part of the typical section we will add stacks. Stacks are always supposed to be within the limits of the stations on the main typical section. The stacks should not be outside of those limits. If they are, the, the designer did something wrong because it's confusing. You can't add, you can't add this little piece of roadway to nothing. So if they, so if they didn't add this to the to the bottom, and the stacks should stack up. So <clears throat> in this case, on the left side. If the le on the left side, we're going to go out from center line. We go 12 feet. We go another 12 feet. We go yet another 12 feet. Then we go six feet to the shoulder. And at that point, then those stacks start to apply. And so between certain stations, you're going to have another 12 feet or you're gonna have a variable width to the, uh, to the curb. So again, those are all, um, those all have to be contained within the nine plus 63 to 12 plus 22, or they have to be between 1222 and 1409. Otherwise they don't add. Don't know where, where to go. Construction notes. Construction notes are instructions to the contractor. We want to tell them what we want to do. We do not want to explain why we're doing it. Mr. Contractor, install this inlet here. Contractor doesn't care that we need that extra inlet to handle the drainage so that there's no water in front of the curb ramp. That's not supposed to be in the construction note. Construction note is just an instruction to the contractor telling them what we want done. We also uh, try to refrain from telling the contractor how to construct it. So we want, we, want the, uh, we want the contractor to come up with the best method 
and the cheapest method for getting it accomplished. So we don't tell them uh, when we say uh, install inlet, we don't tell them uh, that first you need to dig a hole and then you need to uh, place this and do all this other stuff. We're letting them figure that out. Do they bring in a hoe? Do they hand, hand dig it? That's up to the contractor. So we're not gonna tell them method. Each construction item is gonna have a note, a uh, bubble note that's gonna point to the item, uh, particularly in the roadway plans. Uh, and then uh, that note will have the, con the a corresponding uh, text that's associated with it. Yes, this photo was in Oregon. This was on Highway 35 up by Mount Hood uh, when we had a, a washout up there. It was kind of a cool, uh, well, from a railway guy, it was kind of cool. It wasn't so cool for uh, the department, but it was, uh, it, we got some good photos out of it. Engineers always like uh, good photos. Um, storm, storm sewers, those are always uh, going to be read from upstream uh, to downstream. So those, uh, so you should always be able to tell as you're going along on your on your storm sewer design, you should always be going from the highest point to the lowest point uh, as you go down through through your project. Um, they uh, they go from structure to structure on the notes. The notes should also include all of the uh, pipes that flow into that particular structure. Manhole is used to make an angle in the storm sewer. So we don't do, we try to refrain from, yes, you know, over 40 years I have seen blind, what are called blind connections, where we have angle points in a pipe, no manhole there, so it's all buried. Well, cleaning that out can be a real bear, and at that angle point, debris can hang up. And so if you ha don't have a way to access that, you can't clean out the manhole. So anytime that you're putting an angle in your storm sewer, there should be a manhole there so that we can clean it out and do the maintenance on it. We don't put them in just because they're fun to crawl down inside of. And they're really not that fun to crawl down inside of. <laughs> And yes, I have been inside of a manhole. One time, I gotta I got tell you a quick story. One time when I was on a survey crew in, uh, in Bend, it was right about the period of time where we were getting, uh, where we were changing uh, our crews and a lot of uh, females were now on the, on the survey crews at that time. Uh, when I first started, it was almost all male. So, I, here I am, the crew chief, uh, and I had um, all females on my crew. So I popped the lid on this manhole uh, in Bend, and I said, "We need to. Somebody needs to crawl down in there and get the get the elevations and the size of the pipes down in the, at the bottom of it." And I was informed that that was a man hole. And that the females on my crew were not going down that. And I tried to convince them that that was a person hole. <laughs> um, and uh, that, didn't, uh, that didn't work out and I ended up crawling down in the manhole. <laughs> um, Specifications and special provisions. These are, uh, these are things that are just lovely things to read and will uh, uh, just, just tear you up about how exciting uh, construction can be when you read specifications. 
you are always going to need both the standard specification book and the special provision. You can't have one without the other because the special provisions are going to have all the changes to the, uh, specific, to the standard specifications for your project contained in there. So you're going to want to, um, to read both. At the very end of the, uh, the specifications, the way they're set up, the, um, you want to look at the measurement and payment and the bid items. So uh, the point 80, point 90 of the, spe of the specs is one, one of the things that you're going to want to take a look at because it's going to tell you what bid items are for that spec item. And so you're going to, and if there's any changes to that, if there's any little sneaky add-ins of bid items, that's going to occur on the, um, that's going to occur on the, uh, um, in the special provisions. Also in the standard specifications in uh, 150, section 00150, that is your friend because this solves all the discrepancies. So this gives you the, your order of precedence all the way through uh, your set of plans. Contract change orders are number one, special provisions. So if your designer listed a whole bunch of, uh, of items that are specification types in their standard drawing or in their uh, plan set that can be overridden by the text that's in the special provisions. Stamped plan sheets will trump any standard drawing. So if there's, so if there's um, confusion about the standard drawing that's been called out and the, um, the designer modified something on the plan set, the plan set holds. So there's this, this list of, of items here that you want to become very familiar with in looking at that, uh, and that's the order of precedence. This happens to be the one photo that is not from Oregon. This photo is from Iowa, and that's my granddaughter uh, playing with the uh, tiger at the Iowa, at the Des Moines Zoo. And uh, we got the, the tiger actually jumped up on the window and uh, she thought that was quite funny. Uh, when I look back at the, uh, when I look back at the photo, I would go, Ugh. I hope that glass really was thick enough. <laughs> Out of frame, there were some lions that the, uh, that the tiger was wanting to get to. So, we're going to take a look at um, a set of plans, if this, will, if this all works right. So this is a um, this is a actual set of plans that um, that's out there. I'm going to bump up the resolution on that just a little. So <clears throat> this set of plans, uh, right from the uh, from the title page, you can see that this set of plans is using mile points for the stations, and that's because underneath the beginning of project and at the end of project, it says mile point and there's no engineer stations listed. And so this tells you that there is, that this project is all done by mile point. One of the things that we've also, that we've done uh, periodically, or what we've done, not periodically, what we've done with the plans now is that um, the 
title of the project in the title blocks all the way through the set of plans is in the exact same location. So the name of this project or the title of this project is US 97 Spring Creek Hill Modoc Point Section. That's a, that reading it out loud should match exactly reading out loud what the STIP says. The reason why that's important is because years ago, and it wasn't that long ago, the legislature, a legislature, had a pet project, Spring Creek Hill to Modoc Point section, but the contract was mile point 12 to 238 and they couldn't find that project. What was listed in the STIP and what was listed in the contracts that went out, they didn't match when they were read. So when you read these out loud, you want them to read out loud just like they are in the STIP. Don't get so prescriptive that you're worried about whether the road is spelled out or whether it's abbreviated. They read the same. And so that was the, that's the real uh, issue that we're trying to get. The specs and the plan sheets should be exactly the same. That's where it's critical. So when we go through this, so when you get a PDF of a, of a of a sheet, take a look down at the bottom of the title block in the lower right corner and watch, oh, come on, nope, I got to go back out, sorry. So when you scroll through this, notice the title doesn't change. You can easily scroll through a whole set of plans and check the title on a project and see if it moves. It shouldn't move when you quickly scroll through it. Then you only have to check, is the name in the big part of the title sheet exactly the same as the project? And now, is that the same that's listed in my special provisions? If you do that, that eliminates any error. And yes, we have had contractor claims over something that silly. And I will show you that in the next uh, set of plans. So that's one of the things that you need to, to check real quick. The second sheet is where all the standard drawings are going to be listed. And this, again, is a place where you want to go through and do some checking. Hopefully, you are reviewing plans as they come out. And when they list all of the standard drawings on this sheet, they should be someplace in the plans. It's your job to find them. It's, it's, a, it's a game. It's a nice hide-and-seek game. Can you find all of the standard drawings? And if the standard drawings aren't there, but they're called out, that can be a contractor claim. And it's much easier to fight the designer to put that, that uh, name in there, or that, that uh, standard drawing listed there, versus, um, versus a contractor claim. Here's all your typical sections. They did this one by table. It was mile point to mile point. Uh, they were doing a, uh, basically a mill and fill. So this is, this is what, it, what uh, the typical sections look like. 
They did do a little overlay on some ramps. They get into the details, which are the B-series sheets. So they went in and said how they were going to do the uh, way in motion removal. So there was a way in motion uh, device in the road. This is how they're going to remove it and fill it back in. This is how they're going to do the um, rumble strips. And as, they, as you uh, go through all of the details, then you get to the, uh, to the plan sheets. This was the Chiloquin interchange. And uh, this was the part that was a little more complicated, so they gave you a plan view of it. The rest of it was just, uh, if you've ever been to the lovely uh, part of US 97, uh, where Chiloquin is at is straight as an arrow. Uh, pretty much, and um, so it's pretty straightforward. You could do that just with the typical sections. You didn't need the curve information for that, for that project. The next uh, section, of plan, uh, section in the plans was the, how we're going to do the staging. We're going to do one side and then the other. This is how they were going to uh, line out the interchange, put the signs in. This was this uh, next section is the uh, signing plan. It's by a straight line. And I'm going to go out of this one and get into the next. Uh, I'm going to get into my next uh, next slide here because I'm running out of time. So we'll take a quick, quick uh, scroll through of, the, of this project. This is uh, Oregon 42 Frenchy Creek. And if you scroll through it, oh, something changed. Oh, they said Highway 42, not Oregon 42. Uh, if you scroll down through here, you keep going. And eventually the, oh, something really changed. Uh, the highway changed to the Umpqua Highway. So we're not even on the right highway now on a set of plans. So these are things that you can do by setting that up and being able to scroll through this, you can see where the jump is at and where there's an error in your plans that's a patent error. And you can get that fixed before that goes out if you're reviewing your plans. So it's very important that you get another set of eyes to find these things and get them fixed prior to, um, prior to, the, to the project going out. You also want to check through and make sure that all of your bid items have specs and all your, spe and all your specs you want to check off if they're supposed to have bid items, they better have a bid item. So that's another thing where you can go through and do an easy check. Back when I was um, a design manager and the plans would come, come to me out of my shop, I, those were things that I always checked. Was I always checked for the standard drawings? I always checked for the bid items and whether there was a spec for it. You would be surprised at how many times I found those easy things not reconciled on a project that was about to go out the door. And so if you've checked the plans one time, that's not enough. Each time that the plans are issued, you need to go back through and do that check again. Yes, you can take your review set and take a look at that and say, okay, I found these standard drawings. Did they fix this between preliminary and advanced? But I better go through it again and make sure that they're all there 
And did something else change? Did they change a note and drop the standard drawing reference? When I went through the specs, did they change out a spec? Did they eliminate a bit item? Did they eliminate a spec and we've now got a bit item that's left over in the list? Those are all easy to fix claims that you don't want to have. The contractor will beat you guys up over something that simple. And, the, and it's easy if you just have another set of eyes looking at those plans. I can't stress that enough. That's the easy piece that you can do. You don't have to be a roadway expert. You don't need to be a bridge expert in the plans, but you can take a look and did they do something simple as cross-reference? Anyone can do that. Even Dave Pauley can do that. And you'd be surprised at how many errors I've found over the years that are just simple, silly errors, such as not getting the highway right. Because if you go back up here, we're on the Coos Bay Roseburg Highway. We're not on the Umpqua Highway. And so why did a set of plans say that we were on the Umpqua Highway? We didn't want the contractor to pick up and go to the Umpqua Highway. We wanted them working on the Coos Bay Roseburg Highway. And it's that simple. So hopefully, as you go through these, you will be the one that finds that simple error and everyone will go, wow, you're smart. You're looking at this stuff. You saved me from a simple error. Thank you. I'm sure they will say that. I'm sure they will say that. They tell me that all the time. Actually, the thing that they, they uh, ask me the most is, when are you going to retire? <laughs> So eventually I will make their day. Are there any questions that you have about plans and reading plans? Any yes, questions Molly. for Dave? Yeah, uh, Dave, I manage consultant projects mostly. And so could you talk a little bit about typical sections and how um, they, they need to be portrayed in the plans um, it, it seems to be sometimes our, my consultants will produce either too many typical sections for the work or not enough typical sections or they should have used a table. And it, it, I don't know if, this, if those comments um, are something that I need to fall on my sword about. If it's a big set of plans, it's very costly to have it redone. Um, so I just need to know how, how critical um, typical sections are. Thank you. Uh, typical sections can be, um, can be uh, very critical uh, to the project. And we need to take a Goldilocks approach. Not too many, not too few, just right. And um, that's, that's, a thing, that's, a, that's a piece that really comes with experience um, and is, uh, is really hard to, de to, to uh, determine that. One of the things that we are uh, working on, that I'm working on, uh, is to uh, elaborate uh, and update the um, uh, drafting manual uh, to uh, give better direction on typical sections. So that's a, a piece that I'm working on so that we uh, are able to uh, better articulate exactly what we're looking for in typical sections. The biggest, the biggest item is, the, um, is stacks. 
And it seems like um, once somebody figures out that they can do a stack, that that's the, uh, that's the bomb and they've got to have uh, 35 stacks up on one side and, and 25 up on the other and make it overly uh, complex. If you get more than about two stacks on a side, um, they, re they really need to uh, break out their typical sections and, and add a main uh, typical in there because it, it, it does get uh, very complex in a hurry. The more complex it is, the more chance there is for error. And so you want them uh, to be able to flow and uh, be easily understood. If you're getting confused and lost, probably the contractor is too. And so you might want to have a discussion with your consultant early on, and that's why early review is so important. So, Molly, I would, one of the things I would suggest when you do have a, a consultant on board is that when they start producing their typical sections, ask for an early review of those. And that will help, that will help you head off some of those additional costs. Because if, if they're starting to go down the wrong path and you can catch it even before preliminary plans, you've saved yourself a bunch of time and money. Are there um, drafting guidance for every plan set section? If there isn't, um, what are we supposed to do? Uh, when are you retiring, Alvin? Uh, <laughs> um, we are it, we're in the process right now. Uh, Steve uh, Steve Cooley has uh, camped out on my desk. We're um, in the process of updating uh, the roadway drafting manual. Uh, there is a, um, there's an overarching document. Um, well, let me step back. There was an, in 2005, there was an overarching document called the Contract Plans Development Guide. Don't remember that. Forget it. Well, kind of. There's a new overarching document, Contract Plans Manual, that goes through and sets the, uh, the standards for all of the plan sets. And that is, on, that is on the web. So if you want to know about where the documentation is on, on the major categories, if you want to know the documentation on how the title block is done, that is already up on the web. Underneath that are all the discipline drafting manuals. The, uh, the bridge CAD manual is up and in good shape. All of the traffic manuals, so uh, signs, illumination, signals, all of their drafting manuals are, are pretty well up to date. We are in process of getting the new roadway CAD manual uh, up. There's three chapters, four chapters uh, already up online. So if you, if you uh, uh, search for the contract plans manual or the CPM, you'll find the home page for drafting. Below that is all the discipline drafting manuals. And so that's where you can uh, start finding that, that information. The information on title sheets, that is a chapter that is done and it is in the uh, roadway CAD manual. So, the, so that part is already taken care of. If there is a chapter that is not there, so if there's things on the roadside development that are not, uh, where we don't have manuals, then you do have to go back to the contract plans development guide. There is a link to it on the CPM drafting page. So if you, if you don't find any documentation for what exactly you're looking for, you should be able to go back to that 
contract plans development guide and there should be something in there and it's probably dated and so you're going to want to talk to the to the folks that um, whose discipline that is so if you're in roadside development you want to talk to your uh, roadside development experts in the tech center great thanks Dave I know that um, he got into the weeds a little bit but as a TPM uh, one of the major deliverables are a set of plans, and you have your plans in hand meeting. And so the hope of this session was you don't just have a set of plans and say, go team, review it, but you're walking through the set of plans with the team and at least have some sense of what to look for. It is absolutely the responsibility of the tech center disciplines to do the QAQC. And as an area manager, uh, when I went through a set of plans, I did look at title, title sheets, mile points. Oh, we need a STIP amendment because the project limits changed. Oh, there's missing bid items. Oh, there's there's um, uh, the uh, standard drawings are missing. And so there's some things that we can do to add value, but it gives you a sense as a TPM of where, where there needs to be more quality. And so if I just find a few things as doing a QA, I would just go back to the tech center discipline manager and say, hey, it doesn't look like this set, these set of plans have been checked. So can you have your team members go back and check is really the point. So thank you very yeah. much, Dave. Appreciate um, the information. Yep.